We are at a moment where our democracy is at stake, where our leadership role in the world is at stake, where the lives of tens of thousands of Americans are on the line, lost to incompetence and callous leadership that could care less. We've got to change that. Good afternoon. I'm Jonathan Capehart, opinion writer for The Washington Post. Welcome to Washington Post Live. This is also a special live recording of my Post Opinions podcast, Cape Up. In former President Barack Obama's first term, Susan Rice was the United States ambassador to the United Nations. In the second term, she was Obama's national security advisor. Today, Rice is a private citizen. She is the author of Tough Love, My Story of the Things Worth Fighting For, and under serious consideration to be Joe Biden's vice presidential running mate. Welcome back for the third time to the Cape Up podcast, Ambassador Susan Rice. Welcome. Thanks so much, Jonathan. It's great to be with you. So literally about one minute before we came on air here, there was breaking news that Trump administration drops plan to deport international students in online classes, and your reaction was to applaud. Explain. Do the happy dance. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was such a misguided, uh, stupid decision that they took in the first place. International students are a critical part of our university structure, our college campuses. They bring uh, talent, they bring diversity, they bring resources, and to lock them out simply because their campuses have decided by virtue of the pandemic that they need to uh, conduct classes online in the fall was just callous and, and extraordinarily counterproductive. I haven't had a chance to read in detail the reporting on it, but it looks like uh, the Trump administration saw that, that their effort to defend this uh, policy in court was unlikely to succeed and they backed down uh, and it seems to be uh, a victory for our colleges and universities, our students across this country and across the world. Because so much of our appeal, our competitiveness, our soft power depends on people around the world wanting to come here and learn and study and bring their skills and talents. So this is a good day. Well, Ambassador, let's keep talking about foreign policy. Originally, I was going to start uh, this interview talking about the election in Poland and the, the news of the re-election of pres uh, Poland's President Duda. And he's an ally of President Trump's and a supporter of the right-wing Law and Justice Party. He's been condemned by the EU and Democratic watchdogs. And I'm just wondering how, if you think, President Trump's behavior in the foreign policy space his support for leaders like Duda has contributed to the rise of illiberal nationalist and autocratic regimes around the world? Well, it certainly legitimized the rise of elected autocrats. Uh, and we see that uh, increasingly in different parts of the world. Poland is the most recent example. It's unfortunate because uh, Poland is an important part of NATO, uh, an important part of the EU. But it is moving in a direction where its values and its approach are completely out of step with the other members of the alliance. And it, it suggests that, uh, particularly when it comes to the EU, uh, their position could be in jeopardy down the road if, uh, if there is a further move towards anti-democratic uh, policies and, and structures. Well, Ambassador, is it possible for the alliance to even survive if the superpower in the alliance, the United States, doesn't even bother to champion those demo small d democratic ideals that have been the cement for the alliance for more than seven decades. Well, the NATO uh, alliance is under duress uh, almost entirely because of President Trump's callous disregard for the purposes and 
uh, the interests uh, of this alliance. Our alliance with NATO is built on common values, but it's also built on interests that we stand together as North American allies uh, and North Atlantic allies um, and Atlantic uh, and Europe broadly to counter threats to our sovereignty and territorial integrity as an alliance, uh, which come chiefly from Russia. And uh, when the United States uh, questions the value of our alliances, turns it into a transactional arrangement, uh, when President Trump decides to unilaterally withdraw a third of our forces from Germany without even consulting with the German government and coddles our adversaries from Russia to, to China to North Korea while putting our allies uh, in a very difficult position, it, it does grave damage to the alliance. And that's one of the many reasons why we need change. I don't think NATO uh, and our leadership role in the world can withstand four more years of Donald Trump. And that's why we need change and we need leadership in the form of Joe Biden, who comes out of the bipartisan American tradition of supporting our alliances, of understanding who our friends are and who our adversaries are, and that our leadership and our strength in the world is enhanced when we can bring partners and allies with us. Well, we'll talk more about Joe Biden in a moment, but let's keep talking about Russia, since you mentioned Russia. And we were talking, at least for a little bit, about the, the, the news that broke that the U.S. had received intelligence suggesting that Russia paid Taliban-affiliated fighters to kill American troops in Afghanistan. Here's what you wrote in an op-ed for the New York Times. Quote, at best, our commander in chief is utterly derelict in his duties, presiding over a dangerously dysfunctional national security process that is putting our country and those who wear its uniform at great risk. At worst, the United States is being run by liars and wimps catering to a tyrannical president who is actively advancing our arch adversary's nefarious interests. So, Ambassador Rice, my question to you. So is it incompetence or treason? They're not necessarily mutually exclusive, let, let me say that. But I did not use the word treason. But my point is that one of two things, and maybe both, are, are happening at once. We have a president who could care less about extraordinary intelligence that the intelligence community deemed credible enough to put in the president's daily briefing, the most important and exclusive product they create, that indicates that the Russians are paying Taliban forces or Taliban affiliated forces to kill American servicemen and women in Afghanistan. And what does the president of the United States do? First of all, he does nothing when that information was brought to him. Uh, and I believe it was brought to him both in written form and perhaps earlier by one of my successors, John Bolton. Um, but even today, some two weeks or so after that information, first came to public light, President Trump has said and done nothing critical of Russia, did not indicate any sense of concern or urgency for the safety of our forces in battle, has not, to anybody's knowledge, initiated any actions to respond to Russia. In fact, they've said, you know, we don't believe it's true, so we're not going to bother with it. But the intelligence community, I can assure you, believes it's true or would not have put it in the presidential daily briefing, and even more so, uh, Jonathan, into a product called The Wire, which is the most widely disseminated piece of daily uh, intelligence that the U.S. government produces. It goes everywhere, including to Capitol Hill staffers. So this had to be a piece of information in which they had a good degree of confidence, even if not 100 percent certainty, which is virtually never the case. Um, and President Trump has done nothing. He has uh, left our forces uh, vulnerable and bare. So either uh, he's doing that out of some mysterious uh, motivation to serve Putin's interests, uh, uh, for which we've seen many disparate pieces of evidence over the course of the last four years, but no overarching explanation. Or, uh, and or, he's running a national security process where the people around him are so scared, so incompetent, that they are unwilling or unable to bring to him the information that he must have to serve effectively as our commander in chief and protect our forces in the field. 
Either way you look at it, it's a disaster. And either way you look at it, the message to Vladimir Putin is that he can attack Americans anywhere in the world with impunity and then get invited to rejoin the G7. So I just want to be doubly, doubly sure here because you anticipated a question I was going to ask, and that is, is it possible at all that the president of the United States was not briefed, did not know about this intelligence? And judging by the answer you just gave, it's virtually impossible that he didn't know. Here's what I believe. I believe it was put in his presidential daily briefing. I believe that he often doesn't read and maybe always doesn't read his presidential daily briefing. Any national security advisor worth his or her salt would have read their daily briefing, even if their boss doesn't. And when they saw that information done as I would have done, which is walk directly into the Oval Office and brief the president of the United States orally if, he, if they knew he wasn't going to see it in writing and say to the president, look, Mr. President, we have this deeply concerning information about Russia. Uh, I'm going to work with the intelligence community to run it to ground and, and validate it. In the meantime, I'm going to work with the other agencies and the principals to pull together some options for you to respond, and I will keep you posted. Now, if uh, the current national security advisor didn't do that, um, that to me would be uh, an abdication of his most basic responsibilities. And if he did do that, then the president of the United States is, is lying again. But what I also believe is that John Bolton, uh, who has hinted that information similar to this came to light in 2019 while he was still national security advisor, would certainly not have been so cowed and intimidated not to bring that information to the attention of the president. So I believe one way or another, the president knew and has chosen not to act. So then, Ambassador Rice, my question, follow-up question is, given everything that you said in, in its entirety in response to this, is the president of the United States a national security threat to the United States? I think by virtue of his dereliction of duty, uh, his failure to protect Americans, whether on the battlefield in Afghanistan or here at home, in the face of uh, the, the grave threat from coronavirus, um, and his very bizarre penchant for cozying up to our adversaries and doing Vladimir Putin's bidding is, in fact, acting against the interests of the United States. Uh, and that is, is uh, about as plainly as I can put it. It is, we have a president who is acting against the interests of the United States. We also have a president who likes to uh, spin conspiracy theories and, and disseminate conspiracy theories. One of them is that President Obama and the Obama administration spied on his 2016 campaign. In an interview with the Christian Broadcasting Network, I believe it was in, in June, he said, quote, it's treason. Look, when I came out a long time ago, I said they've been spying on my campaign. I said they've been taping. And that was in quotes, meaning a modern day version of taping. It's all the same thing, but a modern day version. But they've been spying on my campaign. Did that happen, Ambassador? Justin, Rice? you know, and I know, and most of the sentient American people know, absolutely no, it did not happen. That is false. That is another lie designed to deflect from the president's own very bizarre relationship with Russia. Uh, to distract from the much validated reality that Russia interfered in the 2016 election to benefit Donald Trump. Uh, and, you know, President Trump is in some sort of fever dream about the Obama administration when all we tried to do was to execute, despite uh, the Trump administration or incoming administration's reluctance, the most responsible transition we possibly could. You know, I presided over a process, Jonathan, at the National Security Council, where we prepared over 100 individual briefing papers for the incoming National Security Advisor. I spent 12 hours in four separate sessions briefing my successor on all of the important issues that might arise uh, or that were on the, on the table, ranging from Russia to China to pandemic preparedness. Uh, and so our effort was, despite the bizarre nature of the election, despite 
President Trump's strange behavior before, during, and after, um, our approach was to do our utmost in, in, in a responsible handoff from one administration to the other, just as President Bush had done for Barack Obama. No, one, one, of those, one of those papers, you mentioned papers on pandemics. One of them was a 69-page paper that when we spoke in April, you described it as, quote, pandemics, pandemics for dummies. And you said, when we, when we spoke in April, you said th that the idea of a pandemic was, quote, keeping me up at night because we've not begun to hit the top of the curve here. As for, as for the president, you said, quote, and he brags, well, if we hadn't done anything, maybe 2.2 million would have died. And so up to 240,000 is a good outcome. In what circle of hell is that a good outcome? That's what you said to me when we spoke on the podcast in April. Is it safe to say three months later, Ambassador Rice, your assessment has not changed? No, it's changed. It's gotten worse. I mean, not only did we did the president, President Trump, waste two months and do nothing uh, in January and February, brushing this off as nothing more than seasonal flu. Not only was he slow to order the uh, or to, to recommend the shutdown uh, of various states uh, when they were in the throes of the first part of this crisis in March and April, but then he came behind that and all too quickly, in the interests of his own reelection and the interests of uh, his own personal benefit, not the health and safety and the economy of the United States, championed the premature reopening of various states. And what we are reaping now is the result of that extraordinarily irresponsible rush to reopen. And we're seeing it tragically in parts of the West and the South, which were among the states that were the first to reopen and to do so uh, very rapidly without basic precautions like mandating the use of masks and the like. And so it's gone from very bad to frankly worse, and the numbers bear that out. Um, and it's frightening to contemplate how high the death toll may go, so long as Donald Trump <clears throat> is putting his own interests ahead of that of the health and welfare and the economic well-being of the American people. Now he's championing the reopening of all schools everywhere uh, with full class sizes and live teaching, regardless of the circumstances at the local level. Nothing could be more irresponsible. He's willing to sacrifice the health and the safety of our children, their teachers, the staffs at these schools, in order to convey the false reality the false message that America is back and, and ready to reopen. If we had done what people and countries in Europe did, which is to wait till the curve was truly bent, till the infection rate had gone down and the number of new infections was close to zero before beginning the process of reopening, had we done it gradually and responsibly and mandated things like masks and had adequate testing and contact tracing, we would be in a much better place and our schools in much of the country would be able to reopen with minimal risk uh, come the beginning of the school year. Now they face this horrific choice of opening prematurely and putting all of the people in those schools, kids and adults and everybody in their families and communities at enhanced risk uh, or you know, the kids are going to be forced to, to, to lose uh, time and, and, and quality of learning. And it didn't have to be this way. So Amb Ambassador Rice, then, given the spikes that have been happening around the country, I take it you don't think schools schools should reopen, period. One, well, that's, I think, that's pretty clear. Well, Jonathan, I think you can't, you have to look at this at a local level. You have to look at, you know, what is the disease doing? How fast is it spreading? What's the reinfection rate? What's the positivity rate? You know, there are going to be places where uh, things are relatively better than other places. But in the so-called hotspots uh, of the South and the West, when schools are set to reopen sometime in August, it's very difficult to see how they can do so safely. And then even when they do reopen, the CDC guidance uh, before it was manipulated, if, it, if it's going to be manipulated, 
and the advice of experts has been that it is very important to be able to maintain social distancing in schools, at least six feet between students in a, in a classroom. And I was, uh, Jonathan, the co-chair here in Washington, D.C., of our mayor's reopen D.C. advisory group. And we worked through all of these issues, and I was particularly involved in the educational aspects of our recommendations. And the reality is, you cannot reopen safely if you can't maintain that spacing. And most schools don't have the physical space to reduce class sizes by half or more, which is what you're talking about, to enable students mm. to have that degree of space. So in many places, even when the risks are moderate to low, you're not going to have every student in the classroom all day, every day. You're going to have to have some kind of you know, cohorting or, you know, certain amount of days on and a certain amount of days off mm -hmm. when on the off days do virtual learning. Um, and then you're going to have kids, Jonathan, who by virtue of their own health circumstances or that of their parents and grandparents don't feel like it's safe to return to school. So you're going to need to have some continued online learning, even in those places where uh, it's possible to begin to have some version of in-person teaching. Well, Ambassador Rice, then do you think that we as a nation, as we did earlier in the in the pandemic, should we lock down again? Should we stay shut down and stay at home again for at least two, three weeks in order to really, truly bend the curve? In some parts of the country, I think that, it, that unfortunately we must. And I think we've seen a recognition of that, for example, in California, uh, where Governor Newsom you know, ordered the bars closed, the restaurants uh, closed for indoor dining, gyms and uh, churches in, in major population centers and the like, uh, in order to, you know, get a better grip on this. Nobody wants to be in lockdown. Everybody wants to get back to work and school. But to do so safely and therefore sustainably requires that we get that curve bent and keep it down. And it also, frankly, requires, Jonathan, that each of us as individuals recognize that we have to look out for ourselves, but we also have to look out for our fellow citizens. Um, you may be healthy, I may be healthy, my kids may be healthy, but that doesn't mean, one, we can't get very seriously ill with this disease, nor does it mean that we are not in a position to infect others that are more vulnerable. And we're not coming together with a sense of common purpose and unity of effort. Uh, that is necessary to defeat the virus. And that I blame substantially, again, on President Trump. Because have, if we had leadership that was calling on us to come together, that was preaching science and fact rather than bleach uh, and, and, and hydroxychloroquine, um, if he, we had sober, responsible leadership that put the interests of the American people, our health and our welfare and our economic well being first, rather than his personal political ambitions to be reelected. We would be in a far safer and better place. Ambassador Rice, let's move um, to another pandemic or epidemic that we've been dealing with in this country since at least 1619, and that's racism. Uh, let's talk about race. Have you visited Black Lives Matter Plaza here in Washington? I'm just also wondering, uh, are, do you think we are at an inflection point with the national protests that we've seen, the Black Lives Matter protests in small towns and big cities all around the country. Are we at an inflection point? Or do you think we are just having a slight detour on the well-trod road that we're used to going down? Well, Jonathan, my answer to that is it depends. And it depends <clears throat> on us. I think what we saw over the last couple of months has been extraordinary in the wake of George Floyd's tragic murder and that of many others before him. You know, we saw Americans from all walks of life, uh, white, black, Latino, Native American, rich, poor, in every state of this country, in towns large and small, old people, younger people, babies, all coming together largely peacefully to say once and for all that we live in a fundamentally unequal society where people who look like you and me are treated very differently from people who don't, and that that is unacceptable, and that we have, in fact, 
after 400 years, a reality that remains of systemic racism that needs to be rooted out. And if this moment, uh, which has become a movement, results in nothing more than some Confederate flags being taken down and my hometown football team finally changing its name and Confederate monuments being put in museums, and it will be another momentous moment wasted. And that we cannot allow. What we need, Jonathan, beyond the symbolism and beyond you know, steps that might be taken at the, at the local level to address uh, particular problems with policing in our respective communities, we need systemic reform to confront systemic racism. And that systemic reform can only come through the acts of a responsible Congress and a president willing to sign those reforms into law. And it's gotta be the Justice and Policing Act and, and, and much more in the criminal justice realm. But we've also gotta deal with educational disparities, health disparities, housing, the lack of job opportunities, environmental degradation in low income and communities of color in this country. All of these things, and, and Vice President Biden spoke about this today, as he did last week, about an economic agenda that empowers people who have been left out and that takes us into the 21st century economy and puts us at the forefront of things like clean energy. These are things we can do, but we can only do them if we have a president who cares and has a vision and a commitment to rooting out systemic racism and inequality. And if we have a Congress, particularly a Senate, as well as a Democratic House, that is willing to back him up. And that's why I say it depends. If we vote for change, if we vote for the meaning of this movement at the ballot box, then yes, it can become much more than a moment and much more than uh, symbolism. But if we don't, I fear that's yeah. all it will be. I want to squeeze in this audience question uh, before I, I uh, end on asking you about, about Vice President Biden. This is a question from Marilyn from Carl Rudd. He wants to know, what do you think about the idea of defunding the police? Well, Jonathan, I, I think the following. First of all, I, I'm not a fan of the terminology defunding the police because it's been manipulated and misunderstood by many. I think that there is a place for in, in certain local circumstances, depending on um, what is going on in a particular area, to reimagine, uh, re-envision the role that police play, to get them out of some of the work that they customarily do that is more akin to social work than traditional policing. I think they have to be attached to the community and responsible to the community. And yes, there are places where there can be some responsible reallocation of resources, but there's no one size fits all uh, model. There's no uh, cookie cutter approach that you can apply. So I largely agree with Vice President Biden and Representative Jim Clyburn and others that it's reimagining and uh, reinvesting and investing additional resources in our communities uh, that have suffered um, it, as the, the solution rather than a, a vague terminology that has been hijacked mm -hmm. and manipulated by the right wing. Unfortunately, I think that taking the goodwill of people who really want to see positive change and turning it on its head through the term defunding. All right, let's Me, talk about this. By this, I say one other thing. Sorry, sorry. Want to that. You know, President Trump likes to beat up people who have called for defunding and to say extraordinarily obnoxious and offensive things about the Black Lives Matter movement. But yesterday, he called for defunding public schools that don't conform with his autocratic dictate that they reopen regardless of the health of their students and, uh, and faculty. So you know, this, this is how upside down everything is uh, coming out of this White House. So let's, let's talk about this vice president thing. Let's talk about Vice President Biden. You work closely with him during the two terms in the Obama administration. There's a great picture of him giving you a hug after your mother, your mother, Lois Dixon Rice, passed away. Um, do you have the kind of relationship where, with, with Vice President Biden where you could cuss each other out behind closed doors at 9 a.m.? and then be on the same page before the cameras at 9.15? Yes, 
Uh, <laughs> but after have, we wait, have, each other out, it would end with a hug because that's who he is. I mean, Joe Biden is what you see. He's warm. He's empathetic. He's decent. He doesn't use a lot of curse words, by the way. Uh, but I can't always claim the same, just in all candor. But the reality is that Joe Biden is the kind of leader who welcomes robust discussion and debate, looks for people who are unafraid to tell him the truth behind closed doors. But then we're one team, one fight. And once the president makes a decision, as Barack Obama did when Joe Biden was his vice president, whether vice president had recommended that course of action or not, he was four square behind Barack Obama in implementing that policy. And I think that's what he deserves in his own vice president, uh, whomever he may select to, to fill that role. Okay, and aside, aside from candor, which is something that you would bring to the role if you were selected for that role, what's the one, what's the one other attribute you have that would serve an, uh, a Biden administration well? You're, con you're constraining me to one. <laughs> <laughs> hey, <laughs> have at it. <laughs> no, I'm joking with you. No, just one. I think, uh, <laughs> I think the, the most important uh, attribute that I have is almost two decades of experience in senior ranks of the executive branch. I understand how to make the government deliver results. I ran the process uh, uh, at the National Security Council dealing with the most complex and difficult crises we faced in the world, whether it was the Ebola epidemic or the rise of ISIS or how to confront um, China, uh, whatever it is. Um, th my job as national security advisor in particular was to bring the agencies together to tackle the problems at hand. Um, and that is what we are going to need when I hope Joe Biden is the next president of the United States. Um, we're going to have to tackle a pandemic and an economic crisis on the order of nothing like we've seen since the Great Depression. We're going to have to renew and reestablish our leadership role in the world um, and lead the world through this pandemic and an economic recovery. We're going to have to deal with the, the racial justice issues that we've been talking about and what I call an equality agenda, where we can finally and meaningfully make the sorts of investments and reforms that are necessary to redress these systemic inequalities and systemic racism. So one needs to bring the government together in common purpose some, with an understanding of the budget, how to work with Congress, and how to get the business and the, in the elements of government harnessed towards uh, shared uh, objectives. And Jonathan, that's what I have done for the bulk of, of my career. I've done it predominantly in the realm of foreign policy, but foreign policy now is trade, it's climate, it's pandemics and global health. It's a wide span of issues. And those skills and that experience, I think, translate into making government function, whatever the agenda is. And Ambassador Rice, last question. I mentioned I mentioned your mother, Lois Rice, who was who is known as quote the mother of the Pell Grant. Your father, uh, Emmett Rice, was an economist and a former governor of the Federal Reserve. You come from a storied Washington family. I'm wondering, what do you think uh, both your parents would be saying to you or thinking right now to know that their daughter is being talked about as a possible Vice President of the United States. I wish so much, Jonathan, that I could talk to them and have that conversation with them. I, you know, this is uh, a moment where I miss their counsel and their loving advice uh, more than almost any. Um, I think they would be thinking about their parents and their grandparents. You know, I come from the Im from immigrants who came from Jamaica to Portland, Maine, in 1912 with no education and nothing on my mother's side of the family. And they saved and they worked as a janitor and maid um, and sent all five of their kids to college and all their children went on to become professionals. And on my dad's side, you know, he was a grandson of slaves. And, uh, and he was able to rise out of Jim Crow and the deepest form of segregation in South Carolina in the 1920s and 30s and serve at Tuskegee with the storied airmen and then go on to get his PhD in economics and, and join the Federal Reserve Board. And I think they'd be looking back and, and saying that 
you know, what a blessing that in this country, you can be an immigrant, you can be the descendant of slaves, and you can still um, reap the opportunities uh, of this great country. Now, the reality is, Jonathan, I've been extraordinarily blessed, and my parents were extraordinarily blessed. And not all of us, far, far too many of us, don't have the same blessings and opportunities that I had, or even that my parents had. And so I think what they'd be saying now, as best I can guess, is you know, to do what I've always done, which is to serve in whatever capacity makes sense and bring my utmost to it and do it for the benefit of the people of this country, not for myself, not for any ambition that I might have, but serving the people at a time when uh, we are so divided, when there's so much suffering and loss of life and economic hardship, where the, the integrity of our democracy and our very national unity are all at risk. This is a moment where I think they'd say to me, if you're asked in whatever capacity, you got to get in there and do your best and give back for all the blessings that you have had, that I've had, and that they've had. Ambassador Susan Rice, thank you very much for coming back to the podcast. Good luck. We're keeping our eye out to see what happens. Thank you very much again for coming on Washington Post Live. Thanks for having me, Jonathan. And I want to remind our audience that you should head to WashingtonPostLive.com where you can register for upcoming events, including Thursday's Chasing Cancer program featuring Maryland Governor Larry Hogan and actor Patrick Dempsey. Later on Thursday, the artist and activist Common will be here for a special program on prison reform and the impact of COVID-19 on the prison population. Thanks again for watching Washington Post Live. I'm Jonathan Capehart, opinion writer for the Washington Post. Have a good afternoon.